Could Ethereum be the next major play in AI? We're going to break it down for you tonight. Today, uh, we've got a lot of clips, so it's going to be a good one. Make sure and stick around. My name is Paul Barron. Welcome back into Tech Path. Before we get started, I want to thank our sponsor, and that is Tangium Self Custody. It's the only way to go, guys. All you have to do is start with the card, and it's very simple. You get the card from Tangium, you get the app, whether you're iOS, Android, and it's very simple to use and super slick, and it's got a tremendous amount of security built into it. This is one of the ones I like out there. Uh, all you have to do is hit that little green button right there and you'll go right into the three card set. That's the one I would recommend. They did release their recent roadmap uh, here on Twitter just uh, this week. And these are the things that are happening. So a lot of things happening in April, uh, the send screen right, redesign, the new 24 seed uh, uh, passphrase support, a few other things on DEXs and bridges. Uh, there's a new Cardano and Hedera. Uh, tokens coming in. And then, of course, Tron, Polkadot, transaction history. A lot happening in June, especially around staking. So make sure and check that out. I think I can zoom in on that a little bit there. You can kind of see a little bit more about what's happening in staking in June. And then uh, a lot more on and off ramp uh, providers. So with better rates. So this is a, it's a good, you know, it's a, one of the, I think one of the best out there. So make sure and check it out. Use our uh, code. It'll get you an extra 10%. All right, let's get into a couple of points here I want to go focus on. And one, of course, is Ethereum. One of the biggest issues with Ethereum is the fact that it is decentralized. And, of course, this means you need a lot of validators. And with over 1 million validators now in the ETH ecosystem, definitely one of the most powerful systems within crypto as a whole. I want to cut to a clip that kind of goes into a little bit more about why ETH could be an AI strategy for BlackRock. Listen in. Uh, but not all of these stocks, not all these stories, not all of these narratives are created equal. And as much as I would like to see every part of the market rise uh, without um, any pause, I, I, I just think the biggest winners are going to be the biggest growers. And we're not just going to broaden out for the sake of rotation. Is that, a, is that AI? Is that what you're saying? It's hard not to love AI, but AI adjacent themes as well. Combined with earnings, which are still gonna be a major focus for all fundamental investors. You know, there are a lot of enablers in the software space. Obviously, we've taken a good look at a lot of the data centers and other um, companies and industries that kind of enable the AI revolution. And of course, we're focusing really hard on those companies that own the data in each of their industries because they're gonna be the winners. All right, so let's get to another clip here. This goes into some of the strategies that BlackRock is taking around some of these companies that are kind of connecting the dots. Listen in. We also recently learned that BlackRock, the world's largest asset manager, got into the asset tokenization race, creating a fund on the Ethereum network. So what does that signal to you? It signals, I think, something that we've expected for a long time, which is that as money comes into this crypto and blockchain ecosystem, if you want a crypto asset, you will buy Bitcoin. But if you want a tokenized digital asset, you will buy those on the Ethereum platform. Even if it's not a cryptocurrency, if it's a real world asset, gold, oil, you name it, it's going to be on the Ethereum ecosystem. There are always better platforms. Technology keeps moving along. However, what happens is we tend to pick a platform that's widely adopted and it gets a lot of momentum. And we see that in computing platforms all the time. Windows is the world's desktop operating system. IBM has the dominant share, is the 100% share of the mainframe business. Ethereum is, if you think of Ethereum as a computing platform, this idea that we would have a single dominant platform makes a lot of sense. There's quite a few challengers to Ethereum. But Ethereum itself now contains more than 40 layer two networks. So the real competitive action, the real innovation is now happening inside the Ethereum ecosystem, not in competition with it. So, you know, they kind of lean into this whole point that the future does, you know, kind of center around ETH. Granted, there are still challenges around gas fees. This maybe uh, will be resolved by Denkon. We haven't seen that completely uh, play out just yet. But ETH could be the AI token, could be in center, you know, when you think about this, kind of the center of the AI ecosystem, especially as it starts to move into the use cases and utility. I want to go to another clip that kind of goes into this a little bit more. Listen in. I got tired of hearing people say, oh, Ethereum and crypto is just a, is, is a hammer in search of a nail. There are lots of nails out there. If you ask a company how much money do they have, they have a pretty good answer. If you ask them how much inventory, they're like, well, about two weeks, three weeks, that kind of thing. And the reason for that is that we don't, in a disciplined way, reconcile when we say take inventory from one warehouse and give it to a customer or supplier. 
And basically what blockchains allow us to do is to apply the level of discipline that banks apply to money across the banking system and do it across supply chains. And the result is vastly more accurate data and more accurate data translates directly into fewer errors, less inventory required, less shipping required, a smaller carbon footprint. The payoff for just being more accurate is enormous. I think eventually what's ex what will be exciting to see is autonomous AI-based commercial networks. So if you think about a lot of traditional companies, the way they plan for the year is they start with this top-down model. I think we're going to sell as many TVs as we did last year, plus 5%. And based on that, we're going to, we're going to order all the materials and we're going to plan our production. But a lot of digital marketplaces think about like ride sharing or you know, like, uh, you know, couch sharing or, you know, apartment sharing. Those are actually more bottom up marketplaces where lots of providers coordinate together. And all those providers are independently making their own decisions. I think with, with AI systems, you can imagine a marketplace of millions of buyers and sellers, each representing a point in the business network, all making their own decisions and working like a, more like a bottoms up system for managing supply and demand. The AI will make the decisions and the blockchain will be for executing the transactions. Now this may get into kind of an interesting scenario because we've been looking at NVIDIA as kind of being the AI play. In, in reality, maybe it is enterprise compute. And when you think about that, the obvious choice, especially if you look at the blockchain, is going to be Ethereum. You also look at major investors and their strategy around AI. So here's Mark Yusko talking a little bit more around NVIDIA, whether or not he would go in or not. Listen in. What are other things out there, equity or other coin, that you're looking at that nobody's talking about? There are component companies that, that make the machines that secure the network. AMD and NVIDIA have been a story, a proxy to play the, the crypto markets for about six or seven years. But again, they're at valuation levels that are tough to stomach. Uh, there are a lot of really interesting products uh, and new tokens in the private markets. That's where we traffic at Morgan Creek Digital. But we like things like Ethereum. We do like Solana. We do like Avalanche. We will sell on occasion. We sold a bunch of our Solana two years ago when they ran into problems with the network. We sold about two thirds of it. Thankfully, we didn't sell all because it's done well. So you can see uh, Yusko, they're looking at, okay, you can't invest in maybe the biggest AI took or project out there being NVIDIA. What are some of those additional, you know, ecosystems that really do play, especially when you think about crypto? And he did hit on the big three there with ETH, Solana, and Avalanche uh, going forward. But when you think about NVIDIA, maybe it's not necessarily... Um, the idea that AI is the real play for NVIDIA. This is Yatsu. He talks a little bit further about this and where he thinks this is going. Listen in. So talk us through the whole gaming thesis that you've got, which you've obviously built an entire business around. So gaming is the one culture that was born digitally, but influenced the physical world. I mean, NVIDIA would not be the company it is today if it wasn't for gamers trying to buy the fastest graphic card to experience an entirely virtual experience, right? Right? They didn't buy a graphic card so they can sort of, you know, have a physical benefit from it. They, they bought this expensive graphic card so they could have a virtual experience. So they could immerse their mind in something that was really powerful, that was uh, more valuable to them. Um, and then, of course, because of the GPUs um, and because of that, we had initially the mining and blockchain and then afterwards AI. Right. So gaming is the foundation for really, I think, many of these fastest growing industries. And therefore, to us, it would not be at all a surprise that uh, gaming is going to be what's driving Web3. So I think that's been, you know, kind of a narrative that we've talked about here for years on this show. And I think a lot of people who really understand the future of Web3 understand gaming is going to be the centerpiece of that. Now, what does that mean for projects like Ethereum, all the layer twos within that ecosystem, and then some of the other projects that are out there? You have to now take a look at ETH as maybe being a vertical rocket ship. And what I mean by that is take a look at some of the securities that have done well over the past 30 years. Here's a good example of Jeff, Jeff Bezos talking about Amazon, why it could compare to what's happening in ETH right now. Listen in. The riskiest moment for Amazon, Charlie, was uh, at the very, very beginning. I needed to raise a million dollars at a certain point. 
and I uh, ended up giving away 20% of the company for a million dollars. A hell of a deal for somebody. A lot of people did very well on that deal. <laughs> I had to take 60 meetings to raise a million dollars, and I raised it from 22 people at approximately $50,000 a person. And it was nip and tuck whether I was going to be able to raise that money. So the whole thing could have ended before it even started. That was 1995, you know, and the first question every investor asked me was, what's the internet? Yeah, so you think about that. Now, what's Web3? What is crypto? What is blockchain? That's going to be the question I think a lot of people will start to ask now that we're getting mainstream in. You have to remember, guys, most of the people watching the show right now, we're in a bit of a bubble right now. I think most people who are starting to explore this, hopefully they're looking at it much like what was the early stages of the internet. Bezos kind of hit it right there on the head. In those early stages, there's a lot of turmoil that's happening, a lot of things that can cause these markets to become very volatile, which is exactly what we've gone through over the last, really, you know, seven, eight years, for especially for Ethereum. I want to dive into another situation, because you have to also compare this to what's happened with Apple going forward. Now, Apple has a huge event, and they're going to be probably trying to double down on AI. It's coming out in June. It's the big, you know, developers conference. Take a look at this clip. Now let's run down what's going on so far this year. You have the China business, which may not be improving. We saw that iPhone sales fell 24% in the first six weeks of 2024. And then the EU started enforcing its tough new tech law. That's the Digital Markets Act. The EU said Monday it's investigating Apple for violations of the law, which come with steep fines. And then Apple canceled its next big thing, that self-driving car project Titan. And last week, of course, the DOJ unleashed its wide-ranging antitrust lawsuit. So what can change this and turn things around? We'll mark down June 10th in your calendars. And if you don't believe me, just take a look at this X post from Greg Joswiak. He is Apple's marketing boss, teasing a absolutely incredible WWDC. He did the Trump thing and capitalized the A and the I randomly. Oh, sneaky. I was yeah. trying to figure out what was so special about it. All right. So imagine you are an investor and you're thinking, uh, or you're just, you know, you're someone that's looking to catch these early waves because these are what make true wealth. And you look at what's happened in the crypto markets, you look at what's happening in the security side, most likely in the AI sector. Would you bet on Apple uh, to be able to be that next AI winner like an NVIDIA? Most likely, based on what we've seen so far with declining China sales, the sluggish iPhone sales, the not necessarily great strategy in the AR VR uh, world, you know, have not really come out with any innovative new products, uh, you know, since really Steve Jobs. And if you compare all of that and wonder, all right, well, what would be the alternative to that? Well, let's go back to another clip. This will be one that's from the past. This is Steve Jobs talking a little bit more about Apple's future. Listen in. A lot of things have changed. The market's a totally different place than it was a decade ago. And Apple's totally different, and Apple's place in it is totally different. And believe me, the products and the distribution strategy and the manufacturing are totally different, and we understand that. Marketing's about values. The Apple brand has clearly suffered from neglect in this area in the last few years. And we need to bring it back. The way to do that is not to talk about speeds and feeds. And, and one of the greatest jobs of, of marketing in the, that the universe has ever seen is Nike. Remember, Nike sells a commodity in their ads, as you know. They don't ever talk about the product. They don't ever tell you about their air soles and why they're better than Reebok's air soles. What does Nike do in their advertising? They, they honor great athletes and they honor great athletics. That's who they are. That's what they are about. Our customers want to know who is Apple and what is it that we stand for. What we're about isn't making boxes for people to get their jobs done. So the vision of jobs was pretty simple. Uh, you know, this is one that I've studied for quite some time, you know, in my tech career. And if you look back at the history of Apple, it all started around this 2008 period right here. I'm showing here on the chart. And that 2008 period was the beginning and really the birth of Apple just literally going vertical. And it has done, done nothing but go up since then. Obviously, is this another time in which Apple, this is on the monthly chart, just to give you guys a, a little bit of a, an idea. This is the chart moving on Apple. Yeah, right there. That's Apple right there. So if you could imagine, has Apple finally hit the wall? A lot of people may think that they might have because now you've got 
a completely different ecosystem in the mobile compute. You've got a completely different ecosystem around innovation. And that's the one thing that Steve Jobs, I think, would have done differently than Tim, or excuse me, than Tim Cook. And that is, I think he would have opened the doors for innovation. Innovation around blockchain, NFTs, gaming, all of that, I think Apple would have embraced had they had a different strategy. And that probably is one of the things that could take them into another two decades of growth, much like what they've seen since 2008. This is a big, I think this is a big shift going forward. And I think the companies that are going to be around this in the next five, 10 years, unfortunately, may not necessarily be Apple. We'll see how all this goes. And they are exactly right. Nike, of course, continues to kind of just bury the hatchet in terms of the opportunities. We've already seen Artifact. They are now, it becomes the highest earning brand for NFT sales. This is going to do nothing but explode on this. Just to give you an example of some of the facts right here, number of secondary market transactions, they reached 67,500, top 1.29 billion, ranking first among all 12 listed NFT issued brands. Now remember, that's a Main Street, real world brand that operates, like Job said, in the ether, so to speak. They don't necessarily sell shoes, they're selling an idea. And I think that's what Ethereum is. They're, it is selling an idea, an idea of innovation, freedom, all the things in terms of collection, gaming, self-identification, the future of Web3, all of that is a much bigger picture. And I think that's the key here for the future of AI. So hopefully this will kind of lay it all together. I want to play one more clip for you from Steve Jobs on could Ethereum be the next Apple? Listen in. Apple at the core, its core value is that we believe that people with passion can change the world for the better. And that those people that are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones that actually do. Explain to me why this technology is so transformational that people think it'll change the world. Mm -hmm. Because they represent kind of epochal changes in the, the options that we have for interacting with each other. With uh, Bitcoin, it's uh, you don't need banks to send money anymore. It's just something that happens directly peer to peer. And Ethereum extends that to m making digitally enforceable agreements. But that changes whole industries, doesn't it? And it hasn't yet, but we'll see. Do you feel like the destroyer of worlds here? I mean, you can essentially eliminate how many jobs by doing that. Make yeah, destroyer I mean of jobs, creator of better ones. Because <laughs> that's pretty good. <laughs> I like that. Destroyer of jobs are the creator of better ones. The point is, is that ideas are really the currency for the future. Whether you think about AI, whether you think about what's going to happen in blockchain, medicine, the next step of evolution of even mankind, all of this has an opportunity to go to the next level. The key here are the companies that are the gatekeepers. Those are the ones we have to kind of keep an eye on and really kind of break down those walls. That's what we're doing right now. That's what we're starting to see, I think, with the Ethereum ecosystem, along with many others in the layer one area. There's a lot of opportunity here. I think you guys obviously are listening in. If you're not tied into our diamond circle though, that's the next place to go. And that is get a free subscription to that. It's additional content and some of our own emails that communicate with you guys on a daily basis. And it's a great place to get additional alpha. Uh, if you guys want to catch me, it's out there on X, at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechBath.